took a dr trip to Branson yesterday, took a senior group and uh, saw the play Jesus. Uh, if you've not seen it, it's just a tremendous production. The music is great. The production is over the top. And listen, the content was just tremendous. And uh, we serve a God who, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so once again, we, we appreciate uh, Leon and Linda planning that, uh, for Randy driving us. Thank you, Lord. Had a, once again, just had a great time. <clears throat> so anyway, if you see a senior uh, 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 falling asleep, elbow him. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> I never thought that I'd be going to Branson and I'd be getting off a bus, one of them senior groups. I am there. It was fun. It was a great time. <clears throat> we had a couple non-seniors with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, we're just we're just grateful. Had, again, had a good time. Listen, if you're listening online, we appreciate your being with us. Uh, uh, we do know that uh, past uh, month and a half, we've had quite a bit of trouble online. It normally doesn't happen on Sunday morning, but on Wednesday night, uh, Daniel's uh, trying to make some uh, changes to uh, uh, what gets us online and broadcasts us on on Facebook. I won't get into that. Uh, uh, wouldn't mean anything to anybody else anyway. But having had said that, just uh, just know this. Be a little patient. He's working on it. And uh, again, it, it, Sunday morning seems to go fine. Wednesday night, congestion's higher, so we're trying to use a different service to get on Facebook. And we appreciate your patience. We always like to tell people that we, we like to know that you're there. If you'll like it, if you'll love it, it's really important that you share. Uh, you know, we think we say things that are, you know, important. We don't think we're the only voice out there, just like we don't think we're the only good church in Texas County. Uh, we think there's a lot of great places to worship. and uh, But, you know, uh, never know who's listening and whose lives you're going to touch. And, you know, we get reports all the time. You know, somebody in their family said, I listened to your church. And, and you know, and get a report that somebody got saved or somebody got help. So, we, <clears throat> again, we appreciate that. And, you know, and again, we, you know, it doesn't cost uh, uh, them anything. We're not trying to get money out of anybody. Uh, we, you know, it's just a great way to be able to share the gospel. We appreciate everybody's help in sharing those things. Thank you, Lord. want to thank everybody. What a great turnout we had for help. The Clean Up Football Stadium went really quickly. We appreciate that. Thank you ever so much. And when's our next home game? It's a few weeks away, isn't it? October the 1st. Yeah. Anyway, I won't be here. June and me and Miss June will be in, uh, we'll be in Africa right then. And uh, But uh, anyway, uh, we'll appreciate on October the 1st. Is that homecoming or is the next date homecoming? That's homecoming, so that'd be a big event. They'll need plenty of help for that, and we really appreciate a great turnout. Uh, one to support the, you know, the team, and uh, and to support, uh, you know, just help us to be able to, you know, uh, clean up the clean up the stadium. But listen, the band is good. The band is good. Uh, the football team uh, beat Salem. You've seen uh, if you follow Facebook at all, you've seen the many many posts. It's been 40 years since they beat Salem, and. Uh, Thank you, Lord. I don't think I would have posted it near as much as everybody did. <laughs> no, I'm kidding just a little. You understand. No, they were excited. I'm happy for our football team. Amen. Uh, they're two and one. And, uh, you know, we, again, uh, you know, you're just, you know, you're just grateful for your kids. You're grateful that they compete irregardless. And, uh, you know, and for those that work with them and teaching them things bigger than football. Isn't that right? There's, there's bigger things than that from, for, for most of our kids. There's, you know, except for recreationally, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's no life in sports after, after high school, but you learn a lot of things about, you know, uh, you know, teamwork and working together. You can learn something about leadership. You learn a lot about your own character during those times. And so a lot of great life lessons, and we appreciate our schools and our coaches and and parents that uh, that support that it takes takes a lot to make these things happen. And boy, you just appreciate a community that gets gets behind them and helps them. Thank you, Lord. Well, listen, we're going to turn to the Word. Grateful that you're here. Uh, we're uh, we're talking about issues of the heart, and so we're going to do a, a a part two this week. We'll take a text from Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse twenty three. I'll read it, and then we'll pray. It says this, Proverbs 4.23, Guard your heart more than anything else, because it's the source of your, your life flows from it. The source 
of your life flows from it. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. We thank you, Father, that your word is good seed when it's sown on good ground that it will produce good fruit. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Again, talking about issues of the heart, we kind of use this as our jumping off point, our you know golden text is what you would have said in days gone by, and uh, guard your heart. Uh, NIV says, uh, we're out of it. Are the, is a wellspring of life. I like this translation because it says something I'd like to point out this week. Because the source of your life flows from it. Now, if we're talking about the physical body, the heart is the chief organ. It's the most vital organ you have. Because it supplies blood to every other vital organ that you have. I mean, oxygen is necessary, but blood is critical. And so that, that heart, every, every, everything that's working, every limb, every thought process, every organ, is a result of the blood that flows through that heart and keeps that functioning. Now, spiritually, the heart pumps life into every area that God is working. And this is why the proverb says, Solomon says, guard your what? Your heart more than anything else. We're talking about the spiritual heart. Because the source of your life, what? Flows through it. Flows through it. Physically, every action that I'm going to take, if I'm going to work hard, my heart's got to be able to supply the blood so the blood can supply the oxygen to the rest of my body. It's got to work. Same is true for you. Every, every action, everything that you're going to do that's important or significant in life physically, you need for that heart to work. Constantly, something's flowing through it. Any restriction limits you in life. Any restriction. Restrict how much air you get. Restrict how far you can walk. Restrict how long you can work. It can affect your cognitive skills. See the physically, that blood flowing through it must be strong, must be unrestricted. This is why we guard our hearts. Physically, you have to take care of your heart. You know, this year, coronavirus will not care, kill the majority of people in the United States. It will be far, far, far from it. The heart will be the number one issue. The heart will be the number one issue. Spiritually, this is true for the church. You know, over time, you're, physically, your heart gets restrictions. Plaque builds up in your veins. It needs that vital life. As that happens, your heart works harder. The harder it works, sometimes the weaker it becomes. And so we what? We guard our hearts. Spiritually, we must do the same. You know, what builds up in our heart is sin. Sin builds up in our heart. And it restricts the flow of life. I'm telling you that faith doesn't flow in a heart that's restricted. Love doesn't abound. In a heart that has restrictions. Joy is not strengthening us in a heart that is restricted. See, the scripture understands these things long before medical science understood these things. What? Through the heart flows what? Life. Life. And here we are all this time later and we understand how important, how significant it is. And Proverbs was speaking to us all the time. 
Again, we're not making an emphasis just on the physical heart. More importantly, we're talking about the spiritual heart. Why? The spiritual heart, it pumps, a, it pumps a life into my faith. Life into my faith. It pumps life into my worship. So you can worship, but it not have any life. You can say the right things. You can even try to believe the right things. But you need life in your heart. And spiritually, we need that heart to be beating. Every vital issue in life requires a strong heart. If you're going to endure hard times in life and family and work and career, you got to have what? You must have a strong heart. We know in the last days the Bible said men's hearts failing them for fear of things coming upon the earth. You need what? You must have a strong heart. It's, it's critical for you and I. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can locate a heart pretty quickly. You can locate my heart. I could locate your heart. Where's your treasure? It's, it's, we talked about this last week. The, the heart is this. It's a, it's a depository. And whatever you put in it, that's what's in the heart. Almost everybody, I know that, uh, that uh, my kids and especially my grandkids, man, they've, when they were real little, they all had, they like having these special little boxes. And boy, if they could get something to mind that they could put their treasures in, they always got a big kick out of that, you know. And so anyway, they'd have this box, and boy, you'd look in that box, and these, they had their little treasures in there. Now, when I was a little boy, it was a pocket knife. Well, if you lived in the city and you had a pocket knife, I mean to tell you, you had something now. It wasn't like living down here. I mean, every little boy had a pocket knife. No, not in the city. They didn't trust us hoodlums, Al. <laughs> Man, if you had a pocket knife, it's a deal. Boy, you never took it to school. I, you know, uh, and, and they probably don't today. But, you know, when I was in school, nobody thought anything about it, you know. Gun rack in every pickup truck. A gun in every pickup truck. Truck wasn't locked. You know, when I moved to Houston, Missouri, you walk down Main Street, Hugh, there were keys in every car. <laughs> well, that's a lot of trouble to take your keys out of your car. You could just leave and get back in. You didn't have to dig into your pocket. It was easy. It was a good way of life, too. It was a good way of life. You know what's important, but why? Because those are the things you, lock, you, 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 you deposit, you lock up, you put away. The heart's important. It's significant. Now, whatever's in the heart is there because we put it there. Good and evil both proceedeth from the heart. A, a good man out of the good treasure, out of the good depository of his heart, brings forth good things. But an evil man out of the evil depository heart, if his heart brings forth evil things, whatever's in your heart is a result of what you deposited. That's why it's there. There's a depository there. I'll look at some things. That we have departed and deposited in our heart. So that Christ may dwell in what? Your heart through faith. What above all else? Guard your heart. Why? Oh, the depository of Christ in your heart. What do I want to be sharing that heart that Christ is living in? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you be in what rooted and grounded in, in love. Psalms 119, verse 11. I love uh, Psalms 119. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Every verse in Psalms 119 has something to do with God's Word. You will see word, precept, laws, over and over. Every verse. Verse 11 says, I've hidden your word in my what? Heart. I deposited it. It's secure. Why? Oh, we want to guard that heart. Because what are we going to allow that heart to share? To occupy that space. We're talking about the inward man. The spiritual man. I've hidden your word in my heart. Why? So I might not sin against you. Matthew 15, 8, which is a real familiar verse to most people. Jesus is quoting the prophet. These people honor me 
with their lips, Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, God measures the distance between us by where the heart is. He measures the distance. He, he's talking to scribes, to Sadducees, Pharisees. That's what he says. Scribes, Sadducees, Pharisees, hypocrites, he calls them, pretenders. Yeah. These people honor me with what? Their lips. But their hearts are far from me. In their case, he says, they've taken the traditions of men to make the word of God of none effect. But listen, you, it, it, other things, other things can make the word of God of none effect. In Lot, it was living down in Sodom and Gomorrah, seeing and hearing their unrighteous deeds. It vexed his righteous soul. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is what it's, it's, it's a distance. It creates space. When we let the long things get into our heart, once again, what builds up? What makes the heart weak? What separates us from God? I, it, it, you know, it's sin. Listen, folks, that's not just true for them who don't know God. They are separated. There is a golf called sin. Christ bridges that golf. He reconciles, brings these two opposing parties together, man and God, through salvation. But that principle does not change. Sin, sin still separates us from God. Now, Genesis 3, 9, we talked about this a little bit last week. Let's... let's Let's unwrap this thought just a little bit more this week. But the Lord called unto Adam. Ah, man, over the years, these words have spoke to me so often. Where are you? It's a great question. You know, everybody can ask the question to themselves this morning, where are you? Where are you? Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you walk with God? Where are you in your faith? Where are you in your worship? Just where are you in life? Great question. God cries out to man. Adam's standing there representing all of mankind. God cries out. He says, where are you? This is what this is. These three words, where are you? This is the heart of the Father calling out to the heart of his creation. And what's creation's response? Where are you? It's a great question. Best applied to my life personally. The same is true with you. And so I can pose the question to Bill. Bill, just where are you in your walk, in your relationship? Where are you in relationship to his his body. Where are we in relationship to our fellowship with Him? Where are we in relationship to the Word? Where are we in our faith? It's a great question. These are things we should pose to one another. Most importantly, we should pose to ourselves. The Father's calling out. His heart cries out to His creation. Where are you? In Genesis 3, 8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Notice this, they heard the sound of God. They recognized the sound of God. Gosh, I've, I haven't said this in, in, quite, in quite a while, but I, everybody knows I've taught out of the first three books of Genesis quite a little bit. There are certain books that, you know, and everybody's that way. Certain things speak to you more than other. These first three books of Genesis, they speak to me a lot. Genesis is the book of beginnings, often referred to as the seed book of the Bible. I believe that you can find, you, you can find the seeds for every important doctrine and belief in the first three books, or the first three chapters. They're great. So here you have uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. They've eaten of the tree, the, the knowledge of good and evil. They have what? They have sinned. They've rebelled. They've resisted God. God comes, they hear the sound of God in the garden of the cool of the day, and they, they withdraw. He, Adam and his wife, what they hid themselves from what? I, listen to this. This is listen to this, Ray. 
they hid themselves. I, I'd never seen this till, till, till this week. They weren't hiding from God. They was hiding from his presence. 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 They didn't want to be what? In his presence. They didn't want to be face to face with him. They didn't want to be exposed to him. They didn't want to be vulnerable to him. They didn't want to be accountable to him. And they what they withdraw, they pull away from his what? From his presence. He's still in the garden, but they're not in his presence. You could go to you could go to the Capitol. And the governor could be in the meet, in, in the building. So you can be where the governor's at and not be in the governor's presence. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst all the other trees. Let's just hide amongst all the stuff. Just the stuff. You know, you know we got stuff in life. I got stuff. You got stuff. We got stuff. You know? I got things to do, but I point I got things to do. You do too. And if we're not careful, all that other is just stuff. We just hide behind all that stuff. You know what Adam and Eve did? Here's the deal. Adam and Eve broke fellowship with God. Listen, if there will be one thing that I could alarm Christians about, this would be one of those things I would like to alarm them about. We want to get all bent out of shape about lots of things. And listen, I, 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 we hold our convictions deep. Once saved, always saved, eternal security, free will. Listen, listen to me. Everybody can agree on it. Here's the deal. Don't break fellowship with God. No problems as long as you don't break fellowship with God. And this is what they do. They broke fellowship with God. Adam, what, wh where are you? What's he recognize? Fellowship has been broken. See, this is what the heart does. Above all else, what guard the heart? Because the heart fellowships with the Father. A guy asked me the other day, why do you yell? I, I'm excited about this stuff. I think this stuff is about life and death spiritually. I believe every week you might speak to somebody and it might change their lives. This is not a lecture. It's a sermon. Jesus teached and he preached the gospel. When he said, he didn't say scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He said scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. There's a place to teach, and I got a lot of teach in me, but there's a place to preach. There ain't no preach in the church. That's why somebody asked me the question here not very long ago. Why do you get so loud? They don't know what preaching is. They're clueless. Whole generation doesn't even know what preaching is. Listen, you can hide, you you cannot hide from God physically. The only thing that you can do is pull away spiritually. It's all you can do. This is what Adam did. He pulled what he pulled his heart away from God. Don't look into my heart, God. Don't question my heart, God. Don't examine my heart, God. God, I don't want to be vulnerable. Above all else, guard your heart. Why? Life flows from it. Listen, I could have talked, with, and we did, and, and, and I'll probably pick it up again. But I could talk about all the other things, you know. You know, sin has been up in the heart. Deception has been up in the heart. Rebellion has been up in the heart. And what? Oh, which, 
It's restricting the life from flowing. What guard a heart? Adam, what? Uh, he, he pulled away from fellowshipping with God. Listen to me. Listen. Listen to me. Listen online. I, 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 my fellowship with God's got to be better than what it is on Sunday morning. Okay? It does. Now listen to what else I got to say. If you're not fellowshipping with on Sunday morning, don't be kidding me about what you're doing through the week. More importantly, you're not kidding God. We're not kidding God. We're talking about what? Now, I'm not talking about believing in God. You understand? Yeah, this is what they, you know, I, I get this stuff. I got family, I got friends, I got acquaintance. They said, but Bill, I believe in God. I'm not asking you to believe in God. Do you fellowship? Do you know him personally? Do you know him intimately? Are you acquainted with his voice? Listen to this, Brenda, about Adam and Eve in the garden. There, God shows up in the garden. You know what they are that most people aren't? They are acquainted with the presence of God. They are, pre and they are acquainted with the voice of God. That's how well they knew God, Randy. They knew the presence of God. They knew the voice of God. It was right there with them. Today, if somebody doesn't tell us from some pulpit, we don't know. I, I don't want to always be telling you what to believe. I want to challenge you about what you believe. You know, one of the Big mistakes the church needed. That's why we needed an awakening and a, a reformation. An enlightening. Is it the church controlled the information about God? Yeah, they did. They controlled the information about God. They didn't put the Bible in a language that people can understand. I don't like all these new translations. Listen, somebody's trying to put it in a language you can understand. I had a guy tell me one time, you know, these, these are just silly things, but they I had a guy tell me one time, listen, I'm like John the Baptist. I believe in the King James authorized version. I, he told that to me for a fact. And I said, now... Hate to tell you this, King James came a long time after John. Long time after John. Well, and, but of course, you still got those. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're married to the King James. And listen, I like most of the scripture I quote is from the King James or the New King James or the NIV. Okay? But I like a lot of translations. And I'm going to study to show myself approved. If, if, if they wander from what is true, I, you're going to know it. You're going to know it. But we're married to it. I, I, you know, well, the reason that there's a new King James Version is because they had revised the old King James Version so many times they could no longer call it the King James Version. No, I'm, yeah. They could no longer call it the King James because it had been revived. So, so be telling me about your authorized version. God wants to speak to you. He'll speak to your heart. He doesn't always say verily, verily. I mean, in our language, really, verily, verily means this is the truth and nothing but the truth. It's kind of like swearing in court. This is the truth and nothing but the truth. Truth, truth. Verily, verily. Truth, truth. Jesus didn't walk around saying, verily, verily. He did walk around speaking truth. God wants what? He wants to speak with you. wants a fellowship with you. They were acquainted with the voice of God. They were acquainted with the presence of God. Listen, just think of what an advantage we should have. We have the presence of God, we have the voice of God, and we have the Word of God. Most of these people, they had to be. They had to know the presence of God. They had to know the voice of God. I think that there's nothing outside the Word of God that you, know, that you need to know, right? Except for something personal about your life, you understand. Adam, what? 
You broke fellowship with God. If I wanted to encourage you to do one thing, don't break fellowship with God. It's about the heart. It's not even whether or not that you're at church, but I'm just saying these things reflect. They reflect some three reasons we hide. God knows our heart. God searches our heart. And God judges our heart. And he's of right to do that. Can I tell you he's a just judge? Yeah. His search isn't to hurt us or harm us, but to help us. God knows our heart. He searches our heart. God, what judges our heart? Above all else, what guards your heart? Take care of your heart. Why? You need life to flow through it. Unrestricted. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. The Lord searches all hearts and minds. Listen. And he all understands all wandering thoughts. Oh, Lord, you've made a lot of journeys with me. He searches all hearts, minds, and he understands all wandering thoughts. Listen, when you, I, for me, helps me. All right, so I'll just tell you, helps me. If my mind wanders somewhere it should not, all I need to do is remind myself that he is on this journey with me. And we change the journey. We change the path that's on. The Lord searches our hearts and our minds. He understands our the wanderings of our thoughts. First Samuel 16, 7, but the, but the Lord said to Samuel, you understand Samuel's gone down to the house of Jesse, he's looking for, he's going to anoint a king. And so Samuel's not coming up with who the king's supposed to be. We've, we've, we've run Jesse's best, his oldest, his strongest. Good-looking young lads. They're all good ones. They're just not the king. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have, what's it say? He's just not king, okay? Just not. The Lord does not look at things as man looks. Man looks on the outward appearance. But where's the Lord look? The heart. Yeah. Examine my heart, O oh Lord. Job said one time, said, you know, search my heart, O oh God. You know, if there's any in, unclean thing in me, show me. We look at the outward appearance. We might look at looks, appearance. We might look at education, background, degrees. We might look at financial status. We might look at their taste in clothes. What's God look at? He looks at the heart. Above all else, guard what? Your heart. Because well, that's what God's checking out. Is your heart. If your clothes are not hanging the same direction in your, in your closet, newsflash, he don't care. Now you care. Listen. And I'm not saying that, you know, taking care of things in life are not important. They, they, they are. Look at your what, though? Look at your heart. Look at your heart. See, the heart is this. The heart is the real you. That's the real you. The real me is not 63 years old. And in just, just a little bit less than a month, I'll be 64. That's not the real me. The real me isn't 6'2 and weighs 217 pounds. It's not the real me. Real me doesn't have kind of a bad knee. See, these are the eternal man. 
Let me say these things. I haven't taught on this in years. Folks have been here a long time. They've, they've heard me teach on this a, a lot. We had kids come through school here. They went to Evangel College, Evangel College, Assembly of God College. Uh, well, folks, if you can do anything, keep your kids out of a secular college in this day and hour. Do everything you can. Do everything you can. I, I, I've, not, I've always understood the financial burden in the past. I, w- I was not near the alarmist that I am today. I am an alarmist today. That's the same as throwing your kids spiritually to the wolves. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Or if they've got to go to a secular college, okay, let's just say that that's, that is the plan of God. All right, let's just say it is the plan of God. Then they better connect with a youth ministry on campus in a strong church because they're going to get hammered week in and week out in that school for their faith. Yeah. And don't pick, don't, don't be picking some church, all right, because of style. You better pick something because of message. And I like style, don't get me wrong. Message is so important during those years. You gotta build your what? Listen to this. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You just live in a body. But you are a spirit. I wish I'd have wrote it that way, because that's the way I believe it. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You just live in a body. One of these days, I'll get a new body, but I'll never get another heart. I've been born again. That soul can be renewed, but it's the same soul. The heart's reborn. The body, it decays. It decreases. It ages. It's subject to the laws of decay and decrease. Spirit? Well, the spirit lives forever. You are a spirit. See, when God cries out, said, where are you? This is not about a physical absence. This is about withdrawing spiritually. He's pulled away. He's pulled away spiritually. He's also pulled away in his soul. Your spirit, the inward man, the heart of man. Your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. I started to say, so we had numerous kids go through Evangel College. By the time the third kid got into got into school, some class this came up over and over again. It was one of the Collins kids. One of the Collins kids told the instructor, I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in the body. He said, I know where you went to church. Everything's in threes. Your spirit and the soul is not the same. But let me tell you this, your body's not the most important. Above all else, guard your heart. You have a body. I'm not saying don't take care of it. I'm saying it's not the most important. I mean, it was a point in time, as before we added on, you know, in the back wall, and I would walk, I'd walk back on that wall, and I'd say, I'd say, yeah, I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in the body. And somebody said, you're going to do that until there's handprints on the wall. Why is that important? See, until you know that you're a spiritual being, you're not going to take care of your spiritual man. Having your body in a pew doesn't change your heart. Put you in a position, I, I, I get that. But you, a body can be in a pew, and you can just be as just rebellious as you can be. I, I, you know, when I was a kid in school, you know, I, I mean, I did this, you know, that, you know, I got sent stand in the corner on a numerous, I wasn't the worst kid in the world, but as a kid, as a boy, I was, you know, I don't know how many times I stood in a corner, you know, stood in a corner. I remember it, they don't do things like this anymore. I'm not, I'm not saying kids don't stand in the corner. I had a teacher put a dunce hat on me one time. I guarantee they don't do that today. All right. I guarantee they don't do that today. That teacher put a dunce hat on me and made me stand in the corner one day. I guarantee on the inside I wasn't standing. Yeah. You can be here and not be receptive. But when you're receptive, you're what? 
Your heart hears the word, receives the word, looks away from, to obey the word. I am a spirit. That is where faith, that's where my faith is operating. You know, in my emotions, emotionally, sometimes I pray and I really feel like it was a good prayer. Always believe it's a good prayer. Sometimes I really feel like God heard it. I always believe he hears it. Why? That's my soul. My mind. My will. My suki. My emotions. My spirit. Numa. They're different words. I what? I live in this body. Adam what? Oh, Adam, Adam tried to withdraw himself physically. But what broke God's heart, why he cried out, is because he had removed himself. He had separated his fellowship. He broke his fellowship with God. He was still his God. God did make him a covering for their sin. Above all else, what guards your heart? 1 Thessalonians 5.23, let me prove to you from Scripture 5.23, may your whole spirit, soul, and body. That's very distinct. Three different words, three different aspects of your life. Spirit, soul, and body. May your whole spirit, entire, complete, Spirit, soul, and body be what kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I wanted to point out to you. It's very clear in Scripture. Above all else, guard your what? Heart. Take care of your heart. Your soul will find rest. Take care of your heart. Your faith will connect with things that your body needs. When you get saved, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. 1 Peter 3, 4. But let it be the what? The hidden man of the heart. Listen. Hidden from sight does not mean hidden from God. I can't see the hidden man of your heart. Are we, sometimes we can see what's in people's hearts. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But it can't see that spiritual being that you are. Then what? Hidden from sight doesn't mean hidden from God. Again, God says to Samuel, he says, I, I, I do not look as man looks. I don't look on his outward appearance. I look at what? I look at the heart. And he could see in the heart of this young shepherd boy, that he, was key, he could be a king. He could see it. Because he didn't look at his outward appearance. His outward appearance, he, didn't, he didn't, didn't look like a king. He didn't look very regal. I, you could put a robe and a crown on him, and it still wouldn't have made him look like a king. It looked like he's wearing his daddy's clothes. What did he look at? Again, he looked at his heart. See, he looked at a shepherd boy, and he said, that shepherd boy, he's not like his brother's. He's a giant killer. Is where? Yeah. yeah. Everybody knows I'm not the biggest dog person in the world or cat person or, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not, the, I'm not the guy that's going to be, you know, having, you know, uh, yeah, you get it. <laughs> if we ever end up with a, with a, with a pet, it will be because June has to have a pet. Not, not necessary for me. Not necessary. But listen, I'm glad. I'm glad for the comfort and the companionship. I, listen, I get people really get that out of it. I, I just, it doesn't do it for me. And, uh, uh, but I know this. You just try to tell one of them little chihuahuas that they're just not a, just not a tiger. <laughs> just absolutely fearless, you know. Uh, they don't have no size, but they got a little heart. A little heart. 
You know, you see that in sports sometimes, you know, people who overachieve, you know. They don't fit the, fit the metrics today, the analytics. But they beat the system and they get in anyway because they had at heart. What's God look at? He, he looks at the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, do this again. It says, guard your heart more than anything else. The source of your life flows from it. See, if I want my faith to be active, if I want it to be strong, if I want it to be ever-growing, the Bible talks about ever-increasing faith. I want it ever-growing. If, if I want the love of God to abound in my heart, if I want to find peace that passes understanding, I need for the heart to be feeding life into those areas. Again, sin restricts the heart. Above all else, what? Guard your heart. It's a source of your life, flows from it. See, if we do not guard our hearts, everything God wants us to be would just be lost. Just lost. Guard it. Take care of it. Make sure things don't get in and restrict your heart. But that is where what the issues are of life flow from. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it's true. It helps us. It speaks to us. Father, that heart is pumping life into our faith. Genuineness and sincerity into our worship. Life into our fellowship with you. Help us to guard it, Father. For just a brief moment, every head bowed, no one looking around, and you might be here this morning, and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Christ. I hear God say, where's your heart? Where's your heart? Oh, he knows if it's a far away from him. He knows if whether or not our heart knows him or not. Again, God's everywhere all the time. But are we in his presence? For us, is it personal? For us, is it intimate? Have you ever trusted Christ? and made him the Lord of your life. Let me say these things to pose a clear question. Now, my question would not be, have you ever joined a church? And I think that that's a wonderful thing to do. It's great. I'm not asking you if you've been a lifelong member of a Sunday school class or if you ever belong to a youth group. I'm not asking if you ever had a leadership role in church. I'm not asking you if grandma and grandpa knew God or if you were raised in church. I'm not asking you if you were a Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, or charismatic. I'm asking you, have you ever made Jesus the Lord of your life? See, that is the issue. I've come to understand Without lordship, there is no salvation. Now listen, here's what the Bible says. That's not a matter of my opinion. Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth, say with your mouth, and if you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Without lordship, there's no salvation. Have you ever given Jesus full control of your life, surrendering everything to him? Sin, hurt, habits, gifts, ability, talents, time. You're giving him everything. Let me be very clear. Jesus don't want just you. He don't just want your pain and your hurt. He'll take it. He heals it. Uh, he, he, he wants it, but he wants everything. He wants your life. Give him your heart. Make him the Lord of your life. If you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, You've never been saved. 
For with the heart we believe, with our mouth, our confession is made. Again, if can you believe these saints? Can you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son? Now, you, again, you could believe that and still not be a Christian. The Bible says even devils believe, and they do something most people don't do. They tremble, too. Oh, they believe in Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son? Do you believe that he lived a, a sinless life? Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Those are all great things to believe. I would commend you, and I'd say, good for you. But you should. You can't be saved without believing these things. Can you believe that he died on the cross, and that on the cross he died and he suffered for you? If you say, yeah, I, I believe that, I'd say, great. That, that, it's so important. Do you believe he was raised from the dead? You say, Bill, I, yeah, I believe that. Listen, that, that is essential. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus. Believe that God raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. If you believe those things, then we're going to call upon the Lord. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember, lordship, salvation. You call upon the name of the Lord. We're going to call. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, would you call on him this morning? Now, you've got to believe it. Nobody can believe for you. Mom and dad can't believe for you. You can't be raised in a Christian nation and be a Christian. You can't be raised in a Christian church and be a Christian. You have to have a personal relationship with Christ. Do you? If you don't, in just a moment, we're going to pray. And we're going to invite everyone to pray with us. The Bible says we can pray one for another. So we, you, we're going to invite everyone to pray. You won't have to do it on your own. But you've got to believe. Only you can believe in your heart. The Bible tells us this, today's the day of salvation. You say, well, Bill, I, I'm thinking about it, but maybe not today. Today's the day of salvation. Do it today. We're going to pray. Everybody praying with us. Say this with me. You've got to believe it in your heart. You're listening online. Say it with me. Say it out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. I believe that He died. I believe He died for me. I believe... He was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord. Take control of everything. Give you everything. I confess you as Lord. I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. And thank you for the free gift of eternal life. Thank you for saving me now. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, no one else looking around, I'm not going to do anything that's going to embarrass you, make you uncomfortable. Listen, if God saved you, that's, that's, that's here in your heart. But if you're here this morning, say, Pastor Bill, I'm not certain that I've ever been saved before. I pose this question if you listen online. I'm not certain if I've ever been saved before. Now, if you're here, this is what I'd like you to do. Just a simple thing. I'd like for you to look up. If you're here and you say, Bill, I'm, uh, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. Today, I've, I've reaffirmed that faith. If that's you, just look up. Just give us a moment as we look around the room. I just want to know who we prayed with and for. Thank you. Give me another moment. Look just a little bit longer. That's me, Pastor Bill. When you prayed, I prayed also. 
Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Amen. Father, you look down from heaven. You see more than our eyes. You see our hearts. You see the decisions and the commitments that we make. Thank you, God, for a brand new heart. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for saving. For others, Lord, you've, you've, you've just restored their fellowship. God, we're grateful for that. Cause your love to be shed abroad in their hearts. Help them to have a assurance this morning that they're saved. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you one more time. How do you know that you're saved? It's not because you go to a church, and that's good. It's not even because you pray, and you should. It's not because you read your Bible. It's because, Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess with your mouth, and if you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. It's because you was obedient to God's Word. Now, certainly you should go to church, and you should pray, and you should read your Bible. But you're saved because you have a relationship with him. What do you do? You believe. Believe. Well, I want to thank you for your time this morning. We're going to turn the service to Leon. Give Leon a hand as he comes.